Vassil, our last face-to-face -face interview was almost two years ago, in January of 2018. What has changed since? You've changed, although we've seen each other during this time, but you've changed a lot. Prior to 2020, I won three belts in two years, and I ended up losing all of them. That's what's changed. You know that, you witnessed that yourself. Two years ago, I think it was during that previous interview, you stated that you are not a businessman, that you remained an athlete. You are primarily interested in winning belts. We are talking about professional boxing now. If we are talking about boxing now, certainly, I remained an athlete in boxing. Has moving up to 135-pound division in the beginning of 2018 changed you as a boxer? I'd say yes. I think so. It has changed me. Because a boxer has to adjust to any change, be it a different weight class or an anthropometric change, you need to change your approach, your tactics, your strategy, and the training accordingly. You can't train the same way in preparation for a fight with a bigger opponent the way you train to face boxers of your size. Meaning you had to change the way you approach training, recovery, nutrition. I wouldn't say that recovery and nutrition changed. Training changed, intensity changed, and probably my boxing style changed as well. Would you agree with the statement that you are small for the 135-pound division? No. It's not that I'm small for the 135. It's just that the 135 is not my natural weight division in boxing. I'm more comfortable in the 130. But we all know why I'm in the 135-pound division now. Anyone who's been following my career knows why I had to move up to the 135. Is that because you couldn't reach an agreement on unification in the 126 or 130? Correct. It was not possible. So I had to move up to 135 and fight with opponents whose fight weight is 152-154 pounds. And what is your maximum weight during a training camp? My weight during a camp is irrelevant, because I might even weight 145. But it doesn't mean anything. The weight gain in 24 hours after the way in. Linares was a good example of that. It seemed that the fight the guy was twice as large as at the way in Possibly. But I knew what I was facing. I realized the opponents would be bigger. And how much do you gain after the way in? If I'm 135 at the way in, I gain 2, maybe 3 pounds. Has anything surprised you in this weight division? For example, punch force. I don't think it was speed. Yes, of course. They're more powerful. They're bigger. When I was in my weight division, I was able to plant my feet and push them off, while here it takes twice as much effort to hold my ground and close distance, to push them off, to shorten it up and tie with them, to shove them. It takes twice as much energy and effort. 135. Is it your top division? As of today, yes. Is it still possible to move further up? It's possible, but who could be my opponent? I think I can even move up to 145, but who would be my opponent? I've always wanted to ask you about your injuries. I even tried to count them. How many have you had in your career? I can count them now. My first injury was of my left arm before the Olympics in 2007. I'd been boxing with that injury for a long time. After that, I pulled my shoulder, I tore it. Then I broke my right hand. Now I have a shoulder injury again. You tore your shoulder during the fight with Linares? Yes. I tore my shoulder during the fight with Linares. After that, I broke my hand, and now I have a shoulder injury again. Why do injuries happen? This is world-class sport. Injuries happen all the time. And my injuries are not major. I'd say I got off easy. Some people had to end their careers at the age of 29, 30, 31 as a result of injury. Boxers damage their hands, their elbows. There are various injuries. As far as I know, shoulder is the most complex joint in the human body. How hard is it 
from the emotional standpoint when you have to recover after an injury, and it's not your first one. Honestly, I try not to dwell on it, whether it's emotionally hard or not. I believe that if that happened, it means I've been sent a challenge I need to go through. Lord does not subject us to more than we can handle, meaning it's within our powers. The way I see it, if that happened to me, it was God's will. What is more difficult in the recovery? Overcoming physical pain or coping with that emotionally? It can be an exhausting process because it can take six or seven months for the shoulder to heal before you are able to get back in the ring. Speaking about my first injury, indeed, it was a long period of recovery. I couldn't do anything for six months. Only after that I was able to resume training. And only after about seven or eight months, I felt I could use my right arm 100%. This time around, I was giving hope that the healing process would take no longer than six weeks. Six weeks have passed now. From my previous experience, I feel that it's healing faster than expected. I hope it will take no more than another week or two. We spoke a couple of days ago. You were training. You were running, I think. I go for a run, but I don't need my arms for that. Legs suffice. Is it the only way you train now? Running, I mean? Yes, it is. For now, it's only running. From what I remember, your goal in amateur boxing was to win the Olympics. Did you turn to professional boxing to get a belt or to become the undisputed world champion? To become the undisputed world champion. I've said that already. Winning one championship belt in professional boxing does not make you the world champion. You win a belt and get a title of the world champion but there are three more belts and three more world champions in your weight division. I did not think of myself as the world champion after the first title, because there should be one world champion in professional boxing, which means you need to win four belts. Could you please shed some light on the following? Your fans would like to see you fighting only the best, only the world champions. How difficult is it for promoters, for platforms to organize that? If it were solely up to me, I would have already fought for the four major titles in three divisions, in 126, in 130, and in 135. It's not up to a fighter, it's not up to a promoter. Promoters depend on broadcasting companies, on television, and television and broadcasting companies determine who, when, and where. They pay money. Why Bob Arum could not negotiate at least one unification fight in 126 or 130 for you? I don't remember exactly why, but I believe it was because there were different world champions in those classes, and they worked with different promoters. They could not agree with each other, because none of the promoters wanted to lose their champion. Looking back on your winning three belts in the 135-pound division, do you think it took too long? Well, compared to what? You may get four titles in one year in some championships, or you might have to go a longer way, when first you have one title fight, and after that, instead of fighting for another title, you might have to defend your first title. Eventually, it takes more time. I was not thinking about how long it would take. Each time I learned my next fight would be a title fight, a unification, it gave me hope, making it more real, bringing me closer. I was pleased with the fact that we had made the right decision, moving up to the 135-pound division. How did you make the decision to move up to 135? Did Bob Arum get involved? No. Or did you come up with this decision with your dad? Like, here's Bob Arum's fighter, and here Garcia would vacate the titles, and that it might be easier to try and unite in the 135? How did it all happen? Before we made our decision, we obtained information. We got the real picture. What was the possibility of uniting titles in the 126, 130, or in 135? The 135 pound division was the most promising one, and we decided to move up, because one belt is good, but four belts are better, so we moved up to the 135. 
What was the most difficult championship fight? Let's not talk about the last one, we'll discuss it separately. Was it with Linares? Linares, definitely. I'm on my championship fights only. Injury, knockdown, need I say more? Campbell is an Olympic champion as well. Everyone compared Lopez with Campbell. Lopez was not your most titled opponent. Right. Campbell is an Olympic champion, but I had no trouble with Campbell. That fight did not present any issues, in my opinion. I did what I needed to do, everything was under control, and what is more important, I came out of that fight with no injuries. The fight with Pedraza was your first fight after the serious injury, right? Yes. It was a good bout as well. I really enjoyed it. Despite lacerations, despite cuts, it was a one-sided fight. I don't believe I got hurt in that bout. That's why I answered Linares. I was knocked down. Before I knocked out Linares, I let a combination go through at a short distance. All these moments. And the pain that you felt in your shoulder. Yes. How should I put it? If it has to be mentioned, yes. Do you remember your first encounter with the Lopez family? I find them puzzling. How did it all start? At some point, he just stormed in from out of nowhere with his talking, first of all. Our very first encounter took place... Was it before the fight with Pedraza or after? I think he was in your undercard. Yes, he was in the undercard. Then it was before the fight with Pedraza. I don't remember which fight was that. I remember that as I was getting out of the ring, he came up to me with Teofimo and said, this is my son, he also fights in your weight division. I said, cool. He said, let me take a picture of you two, stand next to each other. And we did. Everything was quite positive, right? Yes. He took a picture of us. This was how I first met them, how I learned about Lopez's existence. And after that, they started playing their game. But when did they start to ignite the situation? I've heard something happened in an elevator, as Teofimo's father said, or in a hallway. That's true. There was an incident. But it happened after they started talking in their interviews. Initially, they were polite. They were saying that they would fight Lomachenko and that they were capable of defeating me. That was their first interview. And after that, we bumped into each other in an elevator, no, at a hotel lobby, and they started their game. What happened there? As I was entering the elevator with Andrei Borisovich, I heard Lopez Sr. yelling something in my direction. I stopped and turned to face him. He was shouting that his son would demolish me, that he would knock me out, that he would put an end to my career. He behaved aggressively. Evidently, he was drunk. I offered him to bring his son over there so we could resolve it right on the spot. He didn't like it, so he started walking towards me. His friends who were with him held him off. I don't know, were they his friends or team members? They let him in another elevator. That was the first incident. From the marketing standpoint, they did the right thing by starting that trash talk. On your part, I'm not sure whether you were just entertaining the fans or sort of trash talking when you said you expected Comey would win the title, not Lopez. Was that your response to all their verbal attacks? No, I really thought that way. I really thought Comey would win. But what happened, happened. Speaking about Comey Lopez fight, I think that if Comey had not moved forward too early, the fight could have gone under a different scenario, and we could have seen a lot in that fight. Did you think that Comey would be your opponent in the unified title fight? I did. What about contract negotiations? At that time you both had been training for quite a few months already. You were already in the United States. But you signed the contract just one month before the fight, did you? Six weeks before the fight? Two months before the fight. Meaning COVID-19 affected your career as well. 
You wanted to become the undisputed champion in the third weight division, and the pandemic upset your plans. How difficult were the negotiations? It was not difficult for me at all. First of all, I'm not involved in negotiations. It's my manager's responsibility. Okay, was it tough for your team? I don't think so. Because we were ready to agree on terms. We didn't offer to add any provisions to the contract or to take anything out. That's the point. Your side was rather quiet, as usual. Just some minor things from time to time. However, a lot of discontent was coming from the Lopez side, mostly concerning money. He claimed that he was a champion just like Lomachenko, but he was being underpaid. Bob Arum, in his interview, said that you agreed to give part of your purse to Lopez in order for this fight to happen. Is it true? We did discuss that. We had that intention. But it did not come to that. I did not give a part of my purse to them. Bob Arum resolved that issue. But I told Igis that I was ready to share just to make this fight happen. They didn't ask for a certain amount, did they? I saw US media were talking about $850,000. I don't know the amount. It's his contract. Only he and his team may be aware of the terms. I don't know how much he was offered. Because of the world pandemic, the training camp had to stop. Then you started over again. How difficult was that? Such a throwback right before you were ready to begin sparring. Naturally, it did not help any of us. Because it's difficult to be 100% ready in this situation. We had to adjust our training to changing conditions. Were you worried that the fight might have been cancelled or postponed? Of course I was. I was still worried even after we signed the contract. I thought, what if somebody tested positive? What if somebody got injured during the training camp and the fight would not take place? My next question is about the camp. We came to know after the fight that you had a severe shoulder injury. And in fact, it's even more serious than what media told us. If you got injured during the camp, why didn't you try to postpone the fight or to cancel? Well, you would not cancel it, but why didn't you postpone it? Let's discuss it. And I suggest everyone tries to put themselves in my shoes. Can you imagine being given this chance? And the chance is now. You have no idea of what might happen tomorrow, what the world situation would be. What if the pandemic gets worse and we all go in lockdown for the next year or for 18 months? No one knows what might happen next. Besides, there was so much at stake. A lot was said from his side. The MRI did not show any obvious major injury. Based on the MRI results, I was diagnosed with bursitis. It's very common. Bursitis was that what caused pain. And there are injections to relieve the pain. But the injections did not help. You had one injection, and after a certain time you had another injection. Yes. After each injection I had to take a week off. Meaning I had to stop my sparring sessions for one week. When I got back to sparring after a week, came Wednesday or Friday and it hurt again. So I had to go for another injection. It happened three times. And at some point my father suggested we should postpone the fight. But I said, why postponing? Everything's going to be all right. Did you truly believe it? Or did you underestimate Lopez? Or perhaps you were too confident? No, I did not underestimate him. And neither was I too confident. I believed in winning and I believed that my trauma would not stand in the way of my victory. Suppose we have postponed the fight. I would have taken six weeks to recover. And what if then a quarantine would have been announced? In the meantime, Lopez would have a substitute fight. And what if he got injured or lost his belt? Then what? Was that a matter of principle for you to take away the belt from Teofimo and to become the undisputed world champion? No, it was not about Teofimo. It was a matter of principle to become the undisputed world champion precisely then. It was a right here, right now situation. 
Everything was ready for the fight. The fight was in the headlines. Four belts were at stake. It seems that you don't feel this. Maybe. I have no belts. I'm not even wearing one now. Look, what I'm trying to explain is that I could not assume what might have happened next. If I'd cancelled that fight, if I'd postponed it, it would not be possible to know when it might have taken place and whether it would have taken place at all. But you would have had three belts. And so what? I believed I could win that fight. I believed in that. I was not underestimating him. I never said Lopez was a weak opponent. But I truly believed I could win. And besides, I had experience with Linares. I believed that no matter what, I could still pull out that fight with my will and my guts. From what I saw in the media, when Anatoly Nikolaevich suggested you postpone or cancel the fight, you answered that you would rather end your boxing career. Is it true? Yes, it's true. Were you serious? Or was it based on emotions? On emotions, probably. By saying that, I intimated that I would not postpone or cancel the fight. Could you please reveal your tactical approach for the fight against Teofimo Lopez? Of course. What did you have to do? How did you have to proceed for 12 rounds? I had to make him move forward. I had to make him miss his punches and counter-attack with my combinations. I realized the fight would go all 12 rounds. I expected it to be 12 rounds. And I wanted it to be a 12-round fight. The only thing was that I realized I could not start moving forward right from the start. I could not find the right distance I needed to make him fail in his attacks and to counter-attack immediately. But I could not truly find it. And only after I began finding it, I started connecting. But it was the second half of the fight already. I read that some people accused Anatoly Nikolaevich of picking the wrong tactics, that he believed that the fight would be decided in the last three rounds. But what kind of coach would rely on the last nine minutes? People may say whatever they want. They are free to comment. It's called backseat driving. Of course, they know what needed to be done. They are all tactics and strategy gurus. But it was not that Lomachenko we all came to know. I've seen your fights. You were warming up, and you said it took you a while to get started. And I was not worried until the third or the fourth round. Then I saw something was wrong. Your legs. Legs Roy Jones and Tyson were talking about. They say there was something with my legs in the last six rounds. I think I didn't have any issues in the last six rounds. If we compare the first six rounds and how much he hurt me in the first six rounds to the second six rounds and to the damage I caused him, I think the first half and the second half of the fight cannot be compared. As soon as the fight was over, you told Regal in your interview that you disagreed with the judges' scorecards. Not exactly. I said that I was not ready to comment on the fight without going home and watching it first. And I said that I thought I did not lose the fight. That's what I said then, and I can repeat that today. I did not lose the fight. How many times did you watch it? I watched it around five times. What is in your scorecard? We're not talking about 119-109. That lady judge was somewhere else, I think. In my scorecard, I took the second round. He took the first, the third, the fourth, the fifth. The sixth remains questionable, but let the sixth round be his as well. However, I give those rounds to him based on the bias against me. If we counted scores strictly by the book, the scorecard would be different. But as is, he took five rounds in the first half, and I took one round. Now we take the second half. I give myself the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, and the eleventh. And I give him the twelfth. We've got 6-6, six, six, which is a draw. 
And if it's a draw, we have to apply the unspoken rule of title fights. We look at rounds 10 through 12. If the fight was equal, we look into the last three. I won round 10 and round 11. He won the 12th round. 2 to 1. Let's look at the damage. He won the first half. I won the second half. We're dividing the fight by his rounds and my rounds now. The first half and the second half. Even if I won three rounds in the first half of the fight, I mean three more rounds, I would not have won the fight based on the scorecards. What does it say? That they were probably biased? It's not about bias, it's about being set against me. The judges were set against me. We're not even close to unbiased, honest judging. Not even close. Do you think the winner was chosen before the fight? I don't know whose game it was. But you do think they were playing games there? I know for a fact that somebody was playing games. They realized that the possibility of me delivering a knockout was around 20%. Why not play a game then? When was the last time you came out to fight 100% ready, with no even minor injuries? I came out to fight 100% ready when I had no injuries during prior fights. I mean, when you did not have injuries, when nothing bothered you during the camp. I'm not talking about you being sore. It does not happen. You always get some injuries during the camp. I often came out to fight with no issues. If I have to name the fights where I was injured before the fight, I'd say it was this fight and my first fights. The one with the Piri and Pina, I got injured during the fight there. Lopez began talking about you before the fight, and he's still talking about you. You know, I can't imagine Lopez talking in a neutral or a polite manner now. That I cannot even imagine. I don't think I've seen a single interview of him not mentioning your name. It would seem that, hey, you won already, it's time to move on. I believe in one of the interviews he did ask not to mention my name again. It was his first interview. I think he said, don't ask me about Lomachenko after I win this fight. That was before the fight. But now they talk more about a rematch. They claim that it was you who took out the rematch clause. They said it before the fight and they keep reminding you about it now. Is it true that the rematch clause was taken out by Lamachenko's team request? There's been so much hype about the rematch clause. I learned about the existence of such clause from his interview. I didn't even know we had the rematch clause in the contract at all. Prior to this fight, when I signed the contract, I didn't know whether there was a rematch clause in it or not. Usually the manager checks the contracts, and so I honestly never go deep into details. When he mentioned that we would insist on including the rematch clause, when we read about it in his interview, we said, OK, let's not include this clause in the contract. If they are trying to frame it in the way that we allegedly want to play it safe, somehow, then let's not include the rematch clause, that it doesn't bother us. And in his next interview, they claimed I refused to include the rematch clause. And they continue to say some unpleasant things. Yes. I think he said yesterday in an interview that even if he had 100 fights with me, he'd win all 100 times. I'd like to address him. Let's have three fights. I mean, two more. Because the second one would be a rematch, and the third fight will show who's stronger. After the surgery, and it was a major surgery, many people speculated that either something was wrong with Lomachenko during the fight, or Anatoly Nikolaevich chose the wrong tactics. Am I right to assume now that the tactical approach for this fight was based solely on your shoulder limitations? Yes, that's right. I could not apply the tactics we had developed before I got injured. To stick to the initial tactics was not feasible. That's why we had to adjust it after I got injured. 
and I had to proceed with caution during the first six rounds to avoid injuring my shoulder even more, to avoid the situation where I could not continue the fight. That's why I played it safe during the first half of the fight, and then I intensified. And then I realized that I was losing the fight after the first half, and that I had to win the second half. What were you thinking about between rounds? You said you realized that you were losing. What were your thoughts? It's been a long time since you were losing. You only lost twice in your life before. I started thinking about it after the fifth round. I started counting, and I realized that I lost the first round, won the second, lost the third and the fourth, now I just lost the fifth one, now I really needed to come out. I could not afford to lose any more rounds. And during the first several rounds, I was monitoring my shoulder just to see if it hurt or not. Did it hurt? No, it did not hurt during the first six rounds. But I did not punch much though. No uppercuts, no hooks. I especially needed to do it with my front arm, but I could not do it. You could not fully recover by the time of your fight with Lopez. My next question is about his attacks. Lopez tried to go for your body. Did you feel the pain in the shoulder when you tried to protect your body? No. No pain in the shoulder during the fight at all? No. It started to hurt when, towards the end of the fight, I began to realize that I was losing and that I needed to come around. By the end, I mean the second half, rounds 8 and 9, when I realized that I had to win all those rounds, to win compellingly. I began throwing hooks and the shoulder hurt. Was the 11th round the best one? When it looked like you were storming him. At that point, did you go all in? I think I went all in in the 12th round, because it was in the 12th round when three or four of his shots connected and he scored. I wouldn't say I went all in in the 11th round. After the fight, Lopez is said that you played dirty. You lowered your head, trying to headbutt. Could you evaluate this fight? Was it a clean fight? What do you mean I tried to headbutt and dangerously lowered my head? If you watch the video, they accused you of playing dirty. They can accuse me of whatever they want. And that's what they do. They can call white black. It doesn't mean it's true. There is a video. Everyone watched the fight, and everyone re-watched our heads colliding. Our heads collided. I did not headbutt him. And there was a low blow. But they are saying it was a body shot, and it was a knockdown, and the referee should have counted. Have you read that? I have. And I heard about that too. So, it's pointless to rely on what they are saying. There are people who agree with that. That's their business. It means they root for Lopez. There is a question that I haven't asked yet. There are scores that we can argue with. 109-119 could be the judge was following a certain scenario. But it is a fact that America needs their own hero in boxing. They need to have their own undisputed champion. Terence Crawford hasn't become the undisputed champion yet for obvious reasons in a different weight division. America needed a hero. Perhaps they got their hero this way. Could it be possible? And would you agree with that? You do not generate revenue. Yes, I agree, absolutely. That you are not McGregor. Absolutely. Although he is not American. Correct. Of course, I do not generate. You do understand that. And you continue not to do it. I mean, you don't engage yourself in trash talk. Right. Because I won't be myself if I start doing that. But still, I've been trash talking during this interview. I don't want to say certain things. I don't approve of that. But I have to do it. I have to do it in order to draw certain interest to the fight. The person who plays an important role in your professional career is your promoter Bob Arum. What was his reaction and what were his words after the fight? I don't know. 
You did not see each other? You did not talk? No. There was a drug test after the fight, and that was the end of it. We packed and we went home to LA. I went into surgery on the next day. I had a surgery. And in two days, you had a surgery scheduled, right? You knew about it before the fight? Yes, before the fight. I had it scheduled before the fight. I knew the date and time of the surgery. I realized that I needed that surgery. The point is that the MRI had not shown what they saw with an arthroscope. An arthroscope? Exactly. When they put an arthroscope in, they saw that the two incisions from the previous surgery broke open. The labrum, which was repaired, was partially torn again. So it was even worse than the first time. Was it a relapse? Yes. It turned out that I had two injuries, partially torn labrum and bursitis. I did not know the surgery had already been scheduled. How did you feel that night? You came home, you lost, you failed to become the undisputed champion. It was disappointing. I was sad, I was miserable. It was annoying. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Then I had the surgery. Speaking about that night after the fight, when you were alone, replaying it in your head, do you still believe it was not a mistake? Again, I've just learned you had the surgery scheduled already, that your shoulder caused you so much trouble. By mistake you mean I should have refused to fight? No, postponed. I'm not saying refused. I don't think it was a mistake. I understand you were worried that the fight could have fallen through that Lopez could have been out, that anything could have happened. But did you think, even for a moment, that you should have called it off? No, I didn't. You know, just the opposite. A month later, it only strengthened my confidence in the decision, in my beliefs, in the people I believed in. Look, there were many haters, unfortunately. It seemed that they expected you to lose, However, many people from the boxing world questioned the scorecards, like you did, as well as the results of the fight. Andrea Ward is probably the main one. Yes, he immediately said that. He was first who said that and analyzed it from the boxing standpoint. He didn't just say Lamachenko won or it was a draw. He explained why he believed that. Kostet Zhu, many trainers, like Fury's dad, Garcia. How do you feel about that? Trainers said that it was unclear and there should be a rematch. We'd like to see the second fight. I'm for it. I want a rematch. I think a rematch will clarify everything. Either it will be the end of my career if I lose the fight, or I'll take all the belts. I'll achieve my goal and I go on. As for him, watch his interviews. Before the fight, he said that he would knock me out in the third round and people should put money on him. As a result, there were 12 rounds. He constantly changed scenarios. He was hyping up the fight. Now he is saying that he would have knocked me out. What stopped you from doing that? He said that if I had shortened it up earlier, he would have knocked me out. What stopped you from doing that? I shortened it up in the second half of the fight. In the twelfth round, I attacked. You connected, and so what? Where is your knockout punch? That's why I think there should be a rematch, based on the first fight. Whether he agrees to it or not, that is the question. I don't think he will, because they are scared. And they are scared because they know I was fighting with an injury. If I could box like that with an injury, now they know in the next fight I'm not going to sit back and wait. It turned out Lopez was boxing with an injury as well. Which injury? He had a foot injury. Which foot? Right foot. And so what? He said he had a fracture. What fracture is he talking about? Did you see he did a backflip after the fight? What fracture is he talking about? 
Perhaps he broke his toe or foot when he did the backflip. And now he's saying it happened during the fight. No, he broke his foot before the fight. He said that it was three weeks before the fight. He broke his foot. Something like that. Look, you've already just said that there should be a rematch. But if you win, the score will be 1-1. Yes. Maybe the screenwriters have a big trilogy in mind. Maybe. I don't know that. I don't mind. If that's the case, I don't mind. What's next? How do you see it? Let's look at what your beloved media is saying. Are you going back to 1.30? No. Knowing you? No, I'm not going back to 1.30. Why should I do this? I can fight with those who are in the 130 division, and if a bout is organized, I mean in the future, if I'm told that it's not possible to organize a rematch with Lopez, or that it's not possible to fight for these titles, anyway, if he holds the titles, he'll get a mandatory contender. And I may be one of those mandatory contenders. You are ranked pretty high. Here is the answer. Are you ready to make it all over again? I'm not going back to 1.30. Until I'm done here, I'm not going back to 1.30. If there is no rematch, you start all over with any boxer in the top 10 in any weight class. That's right. After your loss, many people were saying that the 135 is not the right division for you, that it was the reason for your loss, that you don't belong to the 135. But I did win three belts before. I did become the champion in three major championships. If one boxer in this weight class won in an unfair way, would that mean that I have a problem in this weight division? Yes. I find it more difficult to fight in this weight class, I don't deny it. It's not the same as in 130. It's not the same as when you fight with boxers of your size and weight. But I don't think that was the reason. One month has passed since the fight. We haven't heard from you. Why did you keep quiet? You have many platforms to express your thoughts, besides your YouTube channel. In Ukraine? In Ukraine, in the US? I don't think so. Why didn't we hear from you after the fight? I cannot believe no one called you and asked for an interview. No one called me. And you know why? Because they did not know your number? Possibly. Secondly, I would not talk to everyone. I like to give interviews to people who understand boxing, first of all, and to people who would not twist my words who would not take my words out of context and use them for a headline. Why am I talking to you now? Because I know you. That's why I'm giving you this interview. So, it was not that she wanted to take a break, to come up with some thoughts, to recover. No. I mean, it was in the beginning. Of course, I didn't have much desire to talk in the first couple of weeks. It's easier to give an interview after a win. Absolutely. Euphoria. And here's just the opposite. You often say in your interviews, my team and I got together, gave it some thought, discussed it. I'm sure you and your team got together, gave it some thought and discussed it. What is the takeaway? We started training and recovery. And we are waiting for the boss's decision. The boss is Bob Arum. Yes, Bob Arum. He's the one who makes decisions. What about your possible fight with Haney? I understand that this suggestion comes from Lopez and some reputable US journalists. Are you actually considering it? With Haney? I doubt Bob will be able to make it happen. I don't mind. I don't mind to fight with other opponents. I'm for it. But they all work with different platforms. Haney is on the zone with Hearn while we are on ESPN with top rank. If they manage to organize the fight, then I don't mind. The last one about Lopez. He says he's ready to fight with anyone, that he's a superstar. From what I see, he has nobody to fight with right now to make money, to hit the jackpot, except the rematch, and they need a pay-per-view for that. They realize that he should not fight with me, because he's just climbed that peak. 
he got lucky and he would want to stay there for as long as possible. For him to agree on a rematch with me would be the same as just bring the belts back and say, thank you, it was fun. They understand it. And they won't do it. They will say whatever. They will throw in various conditions. They'll say we need to do this and we need to do that. And only after that they'll agree to fight. And that I don't want a rematch. But he does understand that a rematch will be a totally different fight. Are there any news from Igis, for example? Igis and Bob need to sit down and talk. But it hasn't happened yet. They're making arrangements, but they haven't met yet. Tell me, has Vasily Lomachenko become a designer? Why? I'm talking about Lomas. Ah, okay, maybe. But it's not just me, it's uh, Sasha and I. Why did you start it? Why not? I mean, you do have taste, no doubt. Look, I'll explain why. When we started our professional careers, when I became the world champion, when I won the second belt, Sasha became the undisputed world champion, people started asking in their comments. For example, I come out in my t-shirt, and we had t-shirts made for my team. It was not a business project back then. But people started asking where they could buy the t-shirt or the tracksuit, and we thought, why not? Why not make it here in Ukraine? Because initially, Og Abel was the first one who made my t-shirts. He would design a t-shirt, make 100 or 200 t-shirts, sell them in the United States, give some to me to give out to relatives and friends, and he would sell the rest of the t-shirts, I don't know, let's say 300. And he made some money to offset the cost of 200 t-shirts he gave to me. That's how it all started. And it was in the States. But people wanted them in Ukraine. Can we order in Ukraine? Can you ship to Ukraine? Where can we buy? So Sasha and I realized that we can make those in Ukraine and give people what they want. That's how Lomas was established. That's how merchandise came about. The merchandise is popular among our fans. How much are you involved in the process? You may just give your names to the brand, you and Sasha. What about the actual design? It's done by our friends. We approve the final design before a product comes out. They show us the merchandise, we approve. Sometimes we take an element out, sometimes we add something, and we approve the final design of a t-shirt or a tracksuit. Is it a business? You do know about sportswear a lot, you wear it very often. You know what's comfortable and what's not. Well, I would say yes and no. Initially we started it because we were getting fans' requests. It just happened. And now people outside the boxing world recognize the Lomos brand. Today it can turn into a business. Will it be a success? We don't know. Here is something that sounds like a dream. Can Lomos turn into a promotional company? Sounds like a dream. You know, it's like a community on Mars in 2050. We are heading in that direction. Right. But it's too far off. It doesn't sound real to us. I find it hard to understand the way it will be. I have difficulty imagining that, just like I have difficulty imagining Lomos a promotional company. It's too early to talk about that while we are still active in boxing. 